Red Test. Sweet. Sour. So good to test. Hello, everyone. Well, we have something interesting tonight. We have a very special, uh, uh, great taste here with Steve Boss and Kathy Dubois. Um, and we have Skype. We Something's going on over here. So anybody within the sound of my voice who's not here at the club room uh, over at hy uh thanks to the beautiful people at hy uh and our pal Dennis, who is uh, our liaison, um, and of course also Steve and Kathy, you need to get down here. Uh, we're having all sorts of fun stuff tonight. There's like there's a garden to my right here, um, and there's a kid chopping up something over there. This is really great. Get by, get by here. Get down here to the high V um, for great taste. And enough of my yapping here. Let's get to it. Steve Boss and Kathy Debar for great taste. Thank you, Mike Ragonia. By the way, I was so impressed. I'm always impressed with Mike does Mike Ragonia's 2.0 and. Last week he had Art Garfunkel as one of his guests, James Taylor as one of his guests, and this this week I know there were a couple of other amazing people on there. So you really got to catch that show. And when is it again? I mean, I know when it, when does it air originally? Uh, it's um, originally okay. The first year it was from Monday at 10 a.m. Monday's at 10 a.m. and and. Wednesdays and Thursdays at 1. So Mondays at 10 a.m. and Wednesdays and Thursdays at 1. That's Central Time. Or you can catch the stream on www.kruufm.com. And now let's get, we're finished with that. Because this is great taste. You are listening to 60 Minutes of the Most Delicious Radio. And we have a lot going on as usual. Kathleen Dubois is here. Hi. You're, hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. How was your dinner last night? It was gluten free too, by the way, because it was rice, right? Right. It was really, so, really wonderful. Yeah. Full of flavor, full of fresh herbs and mm. garlic. And really, really good. White wine. And then topped off with uh, his wife's chocolate chip cookies, which were amazing. Those were not gluten free, I have to say. <laughs> but but we can't. But we could make them that way. Kelly Vetter is here, and you can make chocolate chip cookies, can't you? Gluten free. Yes, you can. Right. Yes, you can. You can make anything just about gluten free. Bake you anything can. that you want. You can. I've even uh, managed to come up with a puff pastry recipe. So, if and you that get I it in mind, you can do it. Sometime we've got to schedule something because I want to taste that. I want to taste that puff pastry. That's that's really. You got that's, a deal. That's something that I really, really would look forward to. We are doing the very first Skype video on great taste and we're very thankful for our engineer Caleb Flynn who's put all this together and from Seattle right now we have author Jean Sauvage on Skype and Jean is the author of the recently published book Gluten-Free Baking for the Holidays 60 Recipes for Traditional Festive Treats and those of you who listen to us regularly you've heard Jean several times on the show over the last few years but we're really excited and I know that she's excited because she's been working so long on this book and it's finally reality it came out about two weeks ago and we're really happy to have you Jean on Great Taste Oh, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. And and what what did you say, Caleb? Didn't disable the screensaver. You didn't disable the screensaver. Okay, so we've got to get that taken care of. So I will allow somebody who has much more technical skill than I do to do that, because I don't know how to do it. Because otherwise, Gene, you're going to get cut off when when the screensaver goes on. Okay. <laughs> this is you are you are you are our guinea pig. So we're happy to have you because we know that you'll be. <laughs> Everybody's helping out. This is great. Hi, Jean. How's the book tour going? Uh, it's going well. I um, just started. I had a, a very. I was able to have an East Coast launch party as well as a West Coast launch party, and um, those went well. So it was very fun. Uh, now I was talking to a couple of uh, our folks here at High V. Uh, Dennis and Eric Lopp, who were in Wisconsin about 10 days ago, and they said that your book was all over this one bookstore that they, they were at, and I was amazed you know, that, that, that it was out already, and they said there were lots of copies there, so that's terrific. Oh, wow, that's great. I know, I think it came out earlier than its actual publication date, so that's cool. 
Aha, uh -huh, so that's what's going on. Now we understand because we were wondering about that. Anyway, Jean is the author of the popular blog, The Art of Gluten-Free Baking, and you can find her website at uh, Gluten-Free Baking. Is, what is your website, actually, Jean? Is it artofglutenfreebaking.com? It is, and it's all spelled out. I'm standing really carefully because they're opening the oven door, and I, I didn't want to back up into it. So what just went into the oven, Kelly? Shortbread. Ooh, shortbread. We are making three recipes. I, should, I guess I shouldn't say we, right, because I'm not actually making the recipes. I did put together some of the ingredients. You did. You did a very fine job. Thank you so much. Kelly Vetter is making the recipes from Jean's book. We have three recipes that we're going to be tasting. We have ch cheese straws, which is our savory dish. And then we have a muffin. What do we have? An applesauce muffin. Yep. I made fresh applesauce for that. And then we have one other. What's the other one that we're doing? Shortbread. Shortbread cookies, because you only told me that about 20 seconds ago. So, you know, what can I say? Anyway, so that's the, that's the story. So we're really looking forward to tasting all those wonderful things. And we want to find out a little bit about the personal stories that are involved, because Jean has her own story as to why She's a gluten-free baker, and we have Dawson with us, who's Kelly's son, and Dawson is busy grating cheese for the cheese straws, and he has celiac disease, and so Kelly had to become a gluten-free baker once that was determined, and she bakes him all kinds of wonderful I things. Do. And uh, one of the things that, Jean, that Kelly is a student at the Culinary Arts Program for Indian Hills Community College, and, and one of the things that Kelly has found out is that her gluten-free bakery goods are, I would say, more popular than the regular bakery goods because Kelly happens to be a really good baker. And she told me, <laughs> told me a little anecdote the other day, which I thought was funny, that the chef who's the director of the program, when, when he first found out about what Kelly, that Kelly baked gluten-free, he said he was never going to eat any of that stuff. Yeah. And now, he said it was now, just dry and yucky stuff. Right, and now Gordon does what? He eats it. Yeah. He says, I've convinced him and changed his attitude towards gluten-free. <laughs> nice. I did. I did. That's terrific. I actually have fed him uh, gluten-free angel food cake, and that is his favorite cake is angel food. And so, yeah. So when I want on his good side, I just make him <coughs> angel food cake. It's just gluten-free. <laughs> you're, you're one smart woman. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. really good. Now, Jean, how about your own personal story? Would you care to share a little bit of that with us? Uh, sure. I became gluten-free after the birth of my daughter, um, which uh, turns out triggered a gluten intolerance. Um, and apparently that's very, very common. What happened was um, I, after my daughter was born, I, I just got sick all the time. And it turned out that I had a doctor who was smart and she gave me the blood test for, um, it's the gliad and antibodies test, which is one of the tests for celiac. And I tested positive on it, but since I had a new baby and I knew that I couldn't eat gluten anymore, um, I decided not to go for the bowel biopsy, which is the gold standard for celiac. So I'm officially gluten intolerant, um, not officially celiac. And um, the other thing is, is that over the past few years, I've developed a wheat allergy, which means that I go into anaphylactic shock if I eat any form of wheat, and that includes spelt and camet. So that's been kind of an odd um, twist to this whole thing. So I'm gluten intolerant and wheat allergic. So. Um, I can't go near gluten if you paid me. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> that is, I mean, it's a little scary, isn't it? I mean, just from the standpoint of everywhere you go, th this is a pretty wheat-based society, isn't it? It really is. Uh, it's interesting because the, the wheat allergy is the thing that really has tripped me up because I think I'm being careful and then I um, have ended up eating uh, wheat by accident about three times since I've been diagnosed. And um, I am shocked that someone like me, who is very careful and very knowledgeable, still can get tripped up when I ask questions and sometimes people don't know what they're answering. So what I've determined is that I really need to see labels whenever I ask at a restaurant. And when in doubt, I just don't eat whatever it is that um, I'm trying to, to eat at a restaurant. So um, it's scary, but it's something that's doable. You just kind of learn how to deal with it. 
It, it seems like uh, how many years for have you been doing your blog now? I've been doing my blog for about three years in terms of the gluten-free baking. It used to be a blog on something else, um, and I've been gluten and free since uh, 2000, so about 12 years. So over the last few years that you've been doing the blog, have you noticed just a exponential growth in the numbers of people who have been attracted to what you're writing? I'm asking this for several reasons, but one is just trying to understand the audience out there. You know, I have. One thing that I found very interesting uh, about the classes that I've been teaching, I teach classes here at local um, kitchen stores, is that the majority of the people in my classes are not themselves gluten-free. They have family members or friends uh, who are gluten intolerant. So um, it's not only are the people who are gluten intolerant interested in baking gluten-free, but their friends and family want to bake for them as well. Um, and that's what I've also been finding as far as the sales of my book. A lot of the folks that are buying the book are buying it to be able to help their friends and family. Um, that said, I think that uh, people who feel better not eating gluten is rising. Um, I, th I have a lot of personal um, uh, theories about that, but I... It seems like everyone I talk to says that they feel better when they don't eat gluten or if they don't eat a lot of gluten. So I think that's very interesting. It's pretty fascinating. And one of the things that I was exploring earlier today, actually, was the potential of a connection between gluten intolerance and the rise of genetically modified organisms in the food system that we have. So there are so... Yes. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I saw the video that you um, uh, recommended to me, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, the other thing is the, the hybridization of wheat. In the past 50 years, we've been hybridizing wheat to the point where our bodies don't recognize it. And so um, it's, if you look at it evolutionarily, our bodies have not evolved as quickly as the hybridization process has evolved wheat. So what we eat now is wheat, modern wheat is not something our body recognizes food. I think that I, I read once that of the, we'll say, thousands of cultivars of wheat that used to exist, in today's world, we probably only are exposed to four of those cultivars anymore, except those people who are involved with artisan bakers, for example, or you know, just have, have a, a family tradition of certain very old cultivars. But in the general public, the general public is exposed to only those four cultivars, and that's it. And they have been changed, as you were just mentioned. Right. Well, the main, um, so what used to be wheat is spelt. And, um, and I think emmer and then camet. And so what we are now eating is wheat has been hybridized, so it grows in um, worse conditions condition that used to be able to grow and also so it has much higher gluten because it's easier to bake with higher gluten in it. It prolongs the shelf life. So yes, what we now call wheat is um, completely different from what used to be wheat. I, I'm looking at Kathy Dubois, my co-host. She's, she's hiding behind the TV over here. This is kind of fun. You should come over here. Come out and see what's <laughs> happening out here. You're watching, you're watching Kelly, do some gluten-free baking. That's what's going on. So the shortbread is in the oven. Right now you're mixing up what, Kelly? The apple muffins. The apple muffins. That's great. The apple, muffin. the apple muffins actually is Jean's special flour mixture. And then actually it's pretty basic. It's salt, um, baking powder, uh, Steve's applesauce, ground cinnamon cloves, allspice, sugar, eggs, buttermilk, and nuts. Her special flour mix is actually a mix of brown rice flour, white rice flour, sweet rice flour, and that actually you would find in like the Japanese aisle normally. That's where I find it. And a tapioca flour, and then something we call xanthan gum, which is actually replaces the uh, gluten, the elasticity in the bread to help keep it together. Now, and Jean, so. how, what was the process like of putting together this mix? Because this forms the basis for ba almost all of your recipes. 
It does. Um, when I started baking gluten-free, I, it was kind of in the dark ages of, of gluten-free baking. Nobody knew really what was going on. There were a few books out there. And so um, I just I went through various books and started doing some research. And it turns out that um, a mix is better than any one flour for, gluten, for most gluten-free baking because no one gluten-free flour mimics um, wheat. So, or the properties of wheat. So I started with a mix that I found in a book called Cooking Gluten-Free by uh, Karen Robertson. She's a local person here in Seattle. And it was based on another person's flour mix, which is called Wendy Wark's uh, flour mixture. This woman named Wendy Wark. And that included, I think it included cornstarch and potato flour and some other things. So I started with that. And as I began to bake for people, I started running into problems. So I baked a lot for a friend who was corn allergic. So I had to find a substitute for corn. And then I started baking for a woman whose daughter was um, nightshade intolerant and potatoes a nightshade. So I had to take the nightshade out. And um, there was another starch in there, I think, that was hard to find. But ultimately, over the series of several years, I finally kind of honed my own mix, which is the mix that um, you guys just heard about, that uh, the, the, the properties I wanted it to have were that it didn't interfere with the taste of the baked good. Um, I wanted it to be, you know, consist of fairly easily available flours. I wanted the flours to be pretty well tolerated by people. Um, so I didn't want any corn or nightshades in there. And so that's where the, the, my mix came in. And, um, it's interesting. I had a, a very similar experience that I think Kelly had where she talked about people really thinking gluten-free baking is almost better than wheat baking. And I used to make uh, coffee for my daughter's PTA's, uh, PTA, uh, PTA coffee hour. And people started asking me, wow, how did you? You do this I said, well it's gluten free and they said wow I need to bake gluten free it's much better than wheat baking so um, that kind of gives you a sense that gluten free baking is actually quite delicious if it's done right I think we, we would be remiss if we didn't go into just a little bit some of the other challenges you have as a mother and a, and a, a wife because your husband and your daughter both have other allergic type of um, uh, medical, essentially, situations that you have to deal with. Right. Well, my daughter, our daughter is peanut allergic, so she has a life-threatening um, allergy to peanuts, and it turns out she's also allergic to soy. So we have to stay away, of course, from peanuts, but we also have to stay away from soy. And actually, that's fine because so much soy in the United States is GMO soy, so I'm happy to stay away from it. Um, my husband... Uh, turns out can't tolerate certain citrus like lemon and also he doesn't do that well with um, almonds so you may hear about a lot of gluten-free baking that contains almond flour as the flour and our family can't use that because um, he can't tolerate that so it's been kind of interesting negotiating all of our um, issues. The other thing that I happen to have is a thing called oral allergy syndrome, which has grown over the years, and it means that I can't eat most fruits, vegetables, and nuts raw. So that's another whole um, element to our eating that's been kind of interesting. Well, the good news is that you're all in it together. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I don't know what it must be like, though, to be traveling and doing this book tour. That must be quite a challenge. Well, you know, so far it's been okay. Um, I've been very lucky in that I've stayed at uh, people's houses, so I've been able to make my own food, which has been nice. And um, I also have a little snack mix that I travel with, with, which has been terrific. And if I kind of, if I stick with really basic stuff, I, I, the the cheese straw recipe that you're making, I often make that as a travel snack because it's got protein and um, it's pretty yummy. So. If I bake for myself and I just kind of, you know, stick to real simple food, I'm actually doing fine. So let's look at the challenges that people have because, quite obviously, 
we live in a society that is fast food oriented. People, if they're not eating fast food, they're utilizing the same principles when they make food at home because they're not really making food, they're buying packaged food and cooking it in, in the microwave. And now we have all these people with allergies who have to really focus on cooking for the most part. Though I imagine there's yeah. probably been a rise in prepackaged foods that are gluten-free too for everybody as time goes on. Yeah. But, but this is a challenge, right? Because this is something that really requires you to, to focus in order to make things work for either you or a family member or a relative. You have to actually really give a lot of thought to preparation uh, to, to making, especially in our society, we are so we'll call it bread oriented whether right. that's whether that's in an accompaniment or a sandwich or in desserts all of those things yeah and i don't think we don't in think there. about it right we don't think about it that that much it, 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 on right. a daily basis uh yeah i agree i you know what i think gluten free has done for me and what i tell people to kind of have it do for them is you have to be more mindful about what you're eating. You have to slow down and take a look at what you're eating. Um, one thing that's really challenging for folks who are just diagnosed as gluten-free is it feels like there's nothing for them to eat, which isn't true, but all of a sudden you feel like you can't eat pasta and you can't eat uh, sandwiches and you can't go get a cookie and it just feels like everything's uh, off off limits and what I tell people to do is go extremely um, uh, simple so if you think about it all fruits and vegetables are gluten free meat is gluten free beans are gluten free um, uh, there's a ton of grains that are gluten free including rice uh, um, uh, corn amaranth, quinoa. So there's a lot out there that's gluten-free if you just slow down and get simple and stay away from the packaged stuff. And then when you're kind of used to doing that, I tell people, then you can add the packaged stuff back in because you're more able to read the labels and make those decisions. Is there something that you know, people might be listening, for example, and, and wonder, well, are there certain things I should look for in my own life that would indicate that I might have some type of intolerance to gluten? Maybe they aren't feeling really great and no one's been able to pinpoint it. Are there basic symptoms that people could look for? Well, I think the the common symptoms are um, digestive ones, you know, a stomach ache, diarrhea, uh, bloating, things like that, you, not feeling well when you eat. Um, that's what I, it turns out that if you're celiac, you might have a latent version of celiac, which is what probably I had uh, my whole life. And so every time I ate, I didn't feel all that well. And I just kind of thought, oh, I have a funny stomach. I, you know, my doctors kind of said that too. And then when the, my daughter was born, it was triggered into full blown um, gluten intolerance or, or uh, technically I'm not celiac, but my doctor actually thinks that I am. And so I think if you, when you eat and you just don't feel that great, that's a good indicator. Um, but there's tons of other indicators there. Uh, if you're anemic, that's an indicator because people who are gluten intolerant don't absorb nutrients and iron tends to be one they don't absorb. So I personally don't absorb um, nutrients very well. And often I have to get iron transfusions, uh, which is, you know, it's not horrible. It's just expensive, and I wish there was a better way. <laughs> um, vitamin D uh, deficient, that's another thing we don't absorb very well. Uh, a friend of mine has something, I think it's called gluten-mediated uh, ataxia, which means there's kind of brain symptoms or feeling lightheaded, dizzy, fuzzy. There's a fuzzy brain component. Um, so I, I think there's just so many different ways that gluten or any um, allergen or autoimmune uh, trigger, uh, there's so many ways that it um, manifests in your body if you don't tolerate it well. I think the really good news is that there are people like you out there that offer a lot of assistance to those individuals who have these problems and they can start to enjoy their food again. We're going to enjoy a little bit later on 
some of the gluten-free baked goods that Kelly's been working on. Jean Sauvage is our guest. She is the author of Gluten-Free Baking for the Holidays. She's coming to us through Skype video right now. You're listening to Great Taste on KRUU-FM 100.1, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. 60 minutes of the most delicious radio on the airwaves. We're going to get back to you, Jean, in just a few minutes. You have to uh, give us a few minutes to enjoy uh, a couple of other interesting tastes that we have. We have with us Jan Swinton. Okay. Jan Swinton is with us, and Jan is our local food coordinator. And last week she was here, and she talked about shoots as opposed to sprouts. And you could call them microgreens. And just because they're grown a little bit differently, because they're grown in soil as opposed to being grown in, in a water environment. And there was so much interest in what she was talking about that she decided to help everybody out because a lot of us are we'll call us city kids and we really said jan we need a kit to to put to do this how do you do it without a kit and so what did you do so i made you a kit <laughs> you are so I sweet was, i was kind of surprised that people in iowa didn't know how to grow stuff i well, most of us aren't from iowa yeah okay so <laughs> there's the issue right there then all right i grew up in iowa and we grow stuff so i brought back the pea shoots this is dwarf gray snow peas and they're fully grown and ready to eat this week and then i brought five kits and they're ten dollars a piece if anybody wants one tonight <laughs> come find me and it's got a complete with the laminated instructions and even uh, uh, resources so you can go online and find seeds for, for your third and fourth and fifth generation in your tray so we are all set tonight and help yourself eat some if you want to and this is all gluten free too of course because it's all just fresh vegetables so it's it's going to be <laughs> I'm loving watching the Skype video do all kinds of funny things <laughs> while, while we're doing this. But anyway, lots of fresh veggies, yes. all, all green, all winter long, right? All green, all winter. And you don't even need much sunlight. This this will work, even in the dark. I, I was interested that she was saying that she couldn't eat raw vegetables. Most of these microgreens do really well in a saute. And so you, they don't have to be eaten raw. You can absolutely saute them and, and uh, cook them in a number of different ways to get them ready for whatever you need for your special diet. All right. Well, we're going to make Jean hungry because we're going to show her exactly what we're talking about. We're gonna I'm going to pick this up. and Well, I thought I was going to do it with one heart. Why not? Yeah, that's it. Now, Jean, can you see what we've got here? The, I can. The forest of green. I love it. Right. So, so that's, that's one of the things. Now, another thing that we want to talk about, because I mentioned this last week, is we, we were talking about espresso machines because I had had an experience where someone had made me a cup of coffee, a cup of espresso in a $2,000 machine, and it was just, like, awful. And, and I said, why do you need to spend all that money? So what we did was Kathy and I brought our stovetop mochas, and this evening we're going to actually make you some decaf espresso because it's late, right? right? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are people that could tolerate caffeine, but we, 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 we can't, so we're making decaf espresso. And we're, gonna sh we're going to hopefully, you're going to have a great experience by enjoying what it tastes like to make stovetop espresso that you can actually go out and buy a mocha for 20 bucks uh, instead of spending 1,000 or 800. Right. Yeah, they're they're ubiquitous in Europe. And it's very simple. You just throw it, the water to the little You can maybe show in the mirror, possibly. The grind is actually in between espresso and and drip, right. And if it gets too fine, because you take and make an espresso, you, you find that the grind will really clog up. And then you just put this on and put it on the, um, the stove top. It's, it's just a stove top. That's all it is. You yeah. wait, you turn up the fire. You, some people say you should keep it really low and let it take time. Other people who I know, I'm looking at one right now, man, they just crank it up and let it get, <laughs> move it fast. I that coffee in the morning. Right. <laughs> so we're going to try that a little bit later. So we're, we're going to try to s have you save some money, you know, over, uh, especially over the holiday season. You don't have to invest in hundreds or thousands of dollars worth of uh, equipment. Yeah. Right? Right. Tom Allen's here. He's been providing a little bit of musical entertainment for us, haven't you? You know, I hear, I hear that you strum every once in a while.
Hey. When wheat was wheat. That's excellent. <laughs> hey, by the way, do you think you could strum a little bit of uh, happy birthday? It's Kelly's birthday. We want to wish her a happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kelly. Thank you for baking gluten-free for us this evening on Great Taste. Thank you. <laughs> That's Happy birthday. The best birthday present I've had all day. <laughs> all right, really great aromas coming out. That's right. We we haven't got that far with technology though for people to enjoy it. But we do have someone came up with I think it was Corey Hickenbottom said that great taste what we should say is it's radio you can taste. So so there we are. We we have radio that you can taste. All right, we want to taste one more thing. And what is that beautiful bottle that you have there, Kath? tell you what when we were talking last night right and we were saying that maybe we should do a risotto clinic again we haven't done it in, in uh, several years on the show so what about if next week we make a risotto with butternut squash and maybe you take a little bit of the butternut squash and make a soup out of it and we'll try the apple vinegar we're, well, you can make the butternut squash soup. I'll make the risotto. But, though, actually, I'll probably hold the mic and you can make the risotto. And, and then what I thought also, Gene, there are a number of, of uh, depending upon how severe your case is of celiac or uh, allergic allergy to gluten, you can also eat farro, which is a very ancient form of wheat. Uh, some people can actually do that. So I thought next week we should make a farrotto, also a cooked farro because wintertime's coming up and it's very hearty and delicious. Does that sound good? We can do that. Yeah. Right. No. <laughs> it, that, that's something just to be aware of, that if you're truly gluten intolerant or celiac, um, any form of wheat is off limits, so even farro. Right. We, we don't want anyone to have a problem with that, but I think that yeah. uh, we can do that. That sounds like fun. So. We're, we're gonna yeah we're gonna do that so now moving <laughs> moving back to back to our gluten-free uh, discussion Kelly right now you're you're grating all the cheese that's yes. gonna go into the cheese straws yes. cheese straws are one of my absolute favorite things in life so I can't wait for this because what I what I'm hoping is there's gonna be lots of cheese in those cheese straws there is a lot of cheese here there is um, a pound of cheddar and well actually two cups of cheddar. I gotta see right here. Two and a half cups of cheddar and one cup of grated Parmesan. Mm. So lots of cheese. Sounds like Jean made a recipe that works for me, so. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I was thinking that, you know, <laughs> dipping these cheese straws in her apple vinegar, might kind of, actually, that's you a, know, apple pie idea. and cheddar cheese go hand in hand. Not so, a bad idea. You know. We can try that. We, we can definitely <laughs> try that. So, and in addition to that, I was thinking that that uh, the you know what else we have we have gluten free beer we were going to try too, so there's another there's another taste treat so. It's <laughs> all so gonna we're gonna all go home with stomach aches is what's gonna happen really so, <laughs> but it'll be a lot of fun while while we're doing it right right. 
<laughs> All right. We're so well I, I think what, what do you find, Gene, when you talk to people, what do you find that the greatest challenges are that they have? Well, I think the thing you talked about earlier, the convenience food issue, that's a big one. Um, you know, like you said, our society is so based on convenience food that people get really um, uh, desperate when they can't find something they feel is easy and quick. And I think people have to redefine their thought about what what me, what is easy and what is quick. For example, I think sautéing some greens, like you were talking about earlier, is a pretty quick meal. But that feels overwhelming to someone who really hasn't um, cooked before. So I think getting back to kind of basic cooking is something that people who are gluten intolerant need to, to do and to learn. And that's frustrating for folks. It feels um, like all of a sudden they have to learn a new skill and they kind of sort of do. Um, the other one is is bread, like you said. Um, access to good gluten-free bread is tough, and I have a recipe in my book. I also have a couple recipes on my blog. I, I also have a recipe for baguettes on my blog, and gluten-free bread is something that everyone asks me about all the time And um, because, you know, it's so easy. You have toast in the morning. You have sandwiches. You need bread crumbs or you need bread cubes for stuffing, that kind of stuff. So, um I would say needing to cook and also access to bread are the two things that people talk to me about the most. When when you've been, you know, with your blog and now going out and meeting people uh, in different places that you're going to be doing, obviously because of the the tour that you're on, uh, I imagine that another thing that happens is you get a lot of people who say thank you, and that must be very inspiring to you. It is. It's really nice. I, you know, I'm a former college teacher. I'm a former college professor. So it, my, my think the, I'm a teacher, and I really enjoy the fact that I'm teaching folks via my blog how to kind of reorient and cook and bake gluten free. Um, so it's very satisfying to me when people tell me this is helpful. Uh, I'm watching. Uh, Dawson is smelling the coffee right now. <laughs> you can see him, right, Gene? You, you can see him smelling. I wish the... I could smell the coffee. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, uh, I, I want to digress for just a minute because there's another thing that you're very much involved in because you're the editor of another blog, aren't you? I am. It's uh, Canning Across America, and it's a canning pre and preserving blog. So that's another thing I do a lot. And canning and preserving is something that's seen, I, I think, quite a resurgence over the last few years. It's always been big. It really has. But, but now it's invaded more, more invaded yeah. the city, yeah. I think. Yeah. Invaded the what? The city. Oh, the city, yeah, for sure. Um, what we're seeing a lot is people want what is called small batch canning, which is, you know, a few jars of canned goods instead of like a huge kettle with, you know, several quarts of something. Um, people who have city kitchens just don't have the space to do large batch canning. Um, so the small batch stuff is really uh, very popular right now. My daughter just made some pickles, and I actually was going to bring them in, and then I decided there's enough flavors going on around here that, that we couldn't do pickles also this evening. So uh, maybe I'll bring them. No, I know, but I, I just couldn't handle it. And now thinking about it, I said, maybe I'll bring them next week. And I thought, no, I don't think that works either, you know, with uh, <laughs> eating that. But she was so... Uh, in our, oh, in yeah, our we could. Okay, let's forget that. Uh, but I, I think that she was so nervous canning and, and she was always just so concerned about being able to get it right is it really that that it, are there that many concerns that you really have to have or is it overblown you know i i don't feel like canning is that hard and what i tell people is if you follow a good recipe and you just follow the directions you're going to be fine um i think where people may get into trouble is when they start thinking of canning as cooking and they start making up their own recipes. And, and unless you're a, a master preserver or you've been canning for a really long time, you don't really know the chemistry behind it. And so I recommend that people don't make up their own recipes. Um, and that's what we tell people. It's, you know, canning is chemistry. It's, um, 
Hi, Dawson. <laughs> it's uh, there to help people um, create uh, food that is shelf stable for a long period of time. So we tell people to get creative later when they're using their canned goods uh, and they're eating it. So for example, when you make a chutney, later on you can serve it with your Indian food or with your pork or whatever. Um, I do a lot of baking with my jam, so I'll take the jam that I've canned and then I use it in my baking. I have several recipes in the book that call for uh, jam, and it's fun to, to use that in baking. Were there any particular aspects of baking that were harder to adapt to gluten-free baking than others? Like, for example, were pies more of a challenge, or were breads more of a challenge, or cookies, or, or uh, what part? You mean in the book itself? Not just in the book, but in your overall... Sure, you can, oh. you can relate it to the book, or just in your overall exploration of the, of the uh, whole gamut of gluten-free baking. You know, I agree with... Uh, well, Kelly uh, talked earlier about gluten-free puff pastry, and that was a tough one. That was a tough code to crack. Um, one of the issues with gluten-free baking or gluten-free dough is that it is less elastic than um, uh, gluten-filled dough because there's no gluten. So even if you have a gluten replacer, and I use xanthan gum, it's it's still you, it's tough to get the dough to a state where you can fold it and you can roll it without it cracking. Um, so I think the puff pastry was a big one for me. That was hard. Um, but I finally did it. I do have a recipe for it on my site. Um, and people say that they're really pleased to have that. Um, another recipe that you know, took a little bit was um, sourdough. I have a recipe for gluten-free sourdough on my site. And as someone who grew up in, in Central California near San Francisco, I really missed sourdough. So that was a, a, something I really, really um, felt good that I was able to crack. Um, and then for my book, it's funny. I tell people that the thing that was really hard was getting a gluten-free genoise cake uh, for the Bouche de Noel. I thought that was going to be easy, and that took forever to figure out a good recipe so it would roll. Um, again, there's cracking issues involved and getting figuring out a gluten-free um, Janois cake. It's a particular type of cake. It's egg-based um, that I could roll without it completely cracking and going um, crumbly was a tough one. But I did that, and that's uh, very satisfying for me. I thought another one that looked like it would be very tough would be panettone. You know, that actually uh, wasn't that hard relatively because I feel like I've already cracked the bread code. So that was just a matter of getting the bread to behave in the way that panettone behaved, if that makes any sense. Um, and so you, the thing that was challenging about that is, you know, it's a bread dough that contains all of these um, uh, dried uh, vegetable uh, fruits. And so, and you needed it to bake up in a, uh, in a particular mold. It's that um, kind of crown mold type thing. And, um, and to get it light, it's, it's got a light crumb. And so that was a little bit of a challenge, but it was not nearly the challenge for some weird reason that the Genoise was. I, I don't know why, but I for some reason that, that Genoise just completely threw me for a loop. Um, the other one that was hard was the Stolen, which is another Christmas cake. It's a German Christmas cake, and it's, to be honest with you, it's another one that has the dried um, fruits, and then it also has a little alcohol in it. And when all is said and done, you fold it and you you just sift a ton of of uh, powdered sugar on top of it, and to be it just looks like a mess. It's delicious, but it doesn't look so great. So um, that and it's supposed to look like a mess, and so um, uh, that took me a little while to come to I guess uh, grips with was just the fact that it was going to look a little bit like a mess. Tom. Can you hear that, Gene? Well, I did. Uh, the problem, well, the thing about eggs is eggs provide their own um, uh, 
their own qualities to baking. They are a binder to an extent, and they are a structure builder, which is what the flour is. The flour is a structure builder. But the problem with it, using eggs as a gluten replacer is they're not elastic. So they bind in a way that isn't, um, it doesn't hold things together that, that gluten does. Um, so eggs, eggs are, are good, but adding just more eggs doesn't really give you the, the uh, gluten quality that you need because of the lack of elasticity. Very interesting. The muffins just came out of the oven, too. And I don't know if you can, I'm going to move your camera so that you can see them. There they are. They look wonderful. So looking forward Yum. to, yeah, looking forward to sampling those for sure. If you want to find out more about what Jean's doing, you can look at her blog, which is theartofglutenfreebaking.com. And her book is Gluten-Free Baking for the Holidays, Jean Sauvage, just published a couple of weeks ago by Chronicle Books. And you are listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa, and way beyond because we stream, right? Kathy Dubois is here. We're going to get ready to have some coffee. 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 As you like to say, right? Some coffee. Yeah, if you're from New right? Jersey, that's how you say <laughs> it. Kelly, uh, what about you? Jean was talking about some of the challenges that she faced and continues to face with, with gluten-free baking. What about you when you started out doing it? I think a lot of it is the same issues. The cracking, you know, that's a big one. Um, the fact that, you know, you get things, they dry, you know. Something with gluten-free cooking, it just seems like when you're baking it in the oven, I mean, a matter of 60 seconds can go from being perfect to burnt. It, you know, it's just something about the flours that you're using that just seem to cook quicker. You know, it's like they have that point you know, one, one point the difference between hot water and boiling water. Well, same thing with gluten-free cooking. One point is the difference between burnt and tasting good. So. I know one of the things that you, you ended up making. <laughs> ended up making a few months ago that I had the pleasure of tasting. I was thrilled at it. It were gluten-free empanadas. Yes. Yes, and actually that one is a wonderful dough. That is actually uses um, baked potato as the base and then add in um, rice flour to help stiffen it up and a little egg and it is just a wonderful dough and you can make it sweet or savory. I use a gluten-free cookie crumb instead of a flour in it to make the sweet empanadas mm. and a little sugar. That's cool. And so it just, you know, works wonderful. You stuff it, pop it into a beautiful oil, and, you know, people don't realize that they're eating gluten-free. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I think, is the ultimate goal, right? Where people actually eat the bread, the empanada, the sh whatever, the muffin, and they don't even have any idea that it's gluten-free. Yeah, I, yeah have, I think that's it. I was going to say, I have a lot of the same word gene. You know, I have kids that beg for me to bring Dawson to have cookies or cupcakes and stuff brought to school because they think they taste better than, you know, the regular stuff. Well, well you're a chef so. also. <laughs> well, it's not just that. It's one of the reasons I'm sure they taste better is because she's making it from scratch. Exactly. Well, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, the other mothers probably buy them some. No, I think that's exactly right. We're, we're such a pre-made society that when someone brings homemade stuff in, it's, it's ten times better than the pre-made stuff. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, the pre-made stuff um, on the market right now is most of it's not that good. So it gives gluten-free baking a really bad uh, reputation. It does. <laughs> that will change over time because as more as more time evolves here, there'll be better and better products that will be available. I remember it's the same thing in almost any industry when organic wines first came on the market. Uh, not that all wines weren't organic at one time or another, but. In, we'll call it in the last 25 years or so, when the organic wine first came on the market, they were they gave such a bad name mm -hmm. to wine, people didn't want to buy them at mm -hmm. all. And so vintners who were making wonderful wines and they were doing it without any chemicals, without any herbicides there, they had certified organic vineyards, they didn't want anything to do with the label. They, they just said, you know, forget it. We're, we, we, we won't have organic on our label at all, even though they were organic because of the the actual uh, reputation that, that came from uh, So Unfortunately, I guess if you're doing gluten-free, you've got to have it on the label because people need to know that. 
Right. It's tough because people sometimes avoid it if it says gluten free. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where I always feel like I have to stay stay near my stuff and say, no, 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 this is really good. <laughs> and once people eat it, they see that it's good, but the, the reputation precedes them. So um, gluten-free does not have a good reputation quite yet. And um, I, I'm hoping that my blog and my book and other books like it are helping. I want to also make everyone aware that there's some very interesting um, we've talked about this over the last few weeks, Kath, recall that Proposition 37 in California, where the, the right to know proposition, where we're talking about the ability for the public to understand whether or not they're consuming genetically modified foods, and Californians will be voting on this on Election Day. And one of our local, we'll call them food heroes, is Jeffrey Smith, and he's been out working in California for quite a long time. And his movie just came out. He has a documentary that just came out, and if you're interested, you can actually see it for free online right now. You can find it at geneticroulettemovie.com. So that's genetic roulette, okay. yeah, genetic roulette movie dot com, and I have to tell you, it's it's um, it's perfect for Halloween because it's really a thriller and it's also extremely scary. So uh, that's a that's a warning that I'm giving everybody ahead of time because it's 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 a very very scary uh, movie. Anyway, that that's one thing you can do, and if you want to find uh, the interview where there's some discussion about whether or not there's a connection between gluten intolerance and genetically modified foods. You can see that also at http colon forward slash forward slash vimeo, V-I-M-E-O dot com, and the following numbers, 512-59453. So that's http colon forward slash forward slash vimeo, V-I-M-E-O dot com, forward slash 512-59453. And I'll try to remember to put that up on the website so people can, can look at it because it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, interview. It's a really interesting interview. All right. So how's that coffee doing? Because it smells really good. It's done. Mm, can't wait to try it out. That's going to be absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it's all done. Jean, when, when, do you have any favorite recipes in the book? Anything that is that a fair question? You know, or do you love no, them all? It's, it's like asking me which of my babies is my favorite. I think <laughs> um, I I I have I have uh, favorites um, uh, as time. You know, it depends on on the day and the uh, what I'm making right now. Right now, I'm really loving the rugula. That's been a fun one. I've been baking those for some of my events, and people like those a lot. Um, and then the Bush de Noel is always fun because it's kind of a showstopper. Uh, and it's very fun for people to see and then to eat. So um, my family loves the Bush de Noel. The rugula sounds fantastic. That's I love rugula, and I'd love to try it. I have to say, I, one of the privileges you have as the show host is you can actually go and taste things when they come out of the oven where everybody has to sit in the audience and not move. And I just <laughs> grabbed a, a few fingers full of the muffins. Absolutely delicious. I'm sure it's the applesauce that made them so good, but <laughs> oh, um, I can't remember. Oh, yes, I think I made that. That's right. Anyway, they're really, really good. So this is a, this is fun for me specifically because even though we've talked with you numerous times over the years, we've never. I don't think we've ever made anything that uh, that went along with the interview. And so now with Kelly here making all these wonderful things and those cheese straws, I'm hoping everybody will leave before they come out of the oven. And that way I can go home with There's them. There's plenty of dough for you to take home and roll. I am not a nice person, let's face it. And when it comes to food, if, if I'm eating french fries, for example, I know that Bob Blankenship went to Nightwood last Friday. And I don't know if he got any french fries because I told him. Did you get them? And, they, and, and what about those french fries? Were they, were they, were they, tasty. they were very tasty and uh, they were actually vegetarian. Mm. Yeah, the french fries, yeah. The oil was, yeah. Well, they have fantastic French fries, but the whole point of the story was if you're, if I'm eating French fries and you try to take one of my French fries and it's a really great French fry like you'd find at Nightwood, watch out because I got a fork and you know you're in trouble. You know, I. <laughs> well, we all love that you love food because if you didn't love food, you wouldn't be doing this show. I think that you're right about that, Ken. I mean, that that is for sure. So we only have a few minutes left, and I've got to find, I've got to get the network back up so I can actually find out how long we really have left. 
So while I do that, I want to ask Gene, can, do you have something just that you'd like to leave everybody with in terms of just some, some thoughts about um, how, I, I think it's difficult. One of the things is, you know, you, you have friends or you have relatives that might be gluten-free, and I think there's always some discomfort with, if you're not familiar with it, then you, you kind of feel like, well, what do I do and what can I serve and who can I, you know, wh that type of thing. Um, I just tell people to um, calm down and to look at what they actually can eat. And probably the majority of their diet, if uh, they didn't have uh, pre-made stuff, is gluten-free. And just naturally, you know, the, the fruits, the vegetables, rice, um, meat, things like that. So that's the thing I tell people to do. And then the second thing I tell people is that there are so many resources now for you to make your own things, uh, for example, gluten-free baked goods, which are really nice, and you can have treats again, and you don't have to feel like you're being left out. I think that's the main thing, because um, I think if you have any kind of food intolerance or allergy or sensitivity, you always feel left out, and um, being able to bake your own thing or bring your own thing, for example, to a potluck is very fun, and it's nice to have other people enjoy it, too. Well, I think one of the major things that's making that happen for people is just being able to have the resources necessary to utilize, such as your book, a blog, people that you can talk to. I'm sure there must be forums out there where people who are gluten-free can exchange information. Yeah, for sure. So, so all those things are really important to make people feel more comfortable with the difficulties that they have when when they're trying to figure out uh, you know what to do now what here's here's a challenge what about batter for f for uh, fried food I know it's not part of your book but have you been able to to lick that one yeah um, I make a really nice fried chicken and I, I I don't do anything special I just use my um, flour mix with a a recipe for a fried chicken batter, and it's really easy. Um, I really haven't found that much of a problem with battered things. Um, so I tell people just to go and find recipes and books they like, and then use a flour mix that they like and do some experimenting and see what happens. Well, Gene, I want to thank you so much for visiting with us and being our guinea pig on our first Skype video. It worked out pretty good, I think. You know, it wasn't it bad. Just did. <laughs> yeah, there were a little bit as Seattle as Seattle got more and more into the uh, you know utilizing the internet after after work. Maybe we had a few glitches here and there, but not, otherwise not bad. Best of luck with your book and best of luck with your tour. And I hope you'll come visit with us again sometime soon. I will. Thank you, and I want to say thank you to Kelly for making all of the recipes. We thank are so you for all of your your progress. <laughs> We're so happy to have Kelly here, and happy birthday again, Kelly. Thanks Thank to Gene, Kelly, Tom Allen, Caleb Flynn, James Moore, Jason Strong, our studio audience, and our wonderful listeners. You've been listening to Great Taste on Solar Powered Crew FM, listener-supported, and absolutely the most wonderful community radio station in the world. Right? Yes. Yep. Red Test Sweet Sour So good to test